So grim. So you look at all of the, the faces that are there, and you have this banquet, and you have more food than anyone could possibly eat. And you have John the Baptist's head there on a platter. But as you look at that scene, you get this sense of all the faces of the people who are there at that banquet. There was, there's nothing. There's no life there at all. And then you see John the Baptist's head, and it's almost as if that's the only place in the picture where you see real humanity. <coughs> you see the goodness in John the Baptist's face. But if we move on, the next lines that we arrive at, the final lines describing this moment in Mark's gospel, tell us this. When his disciples, that's the disciples of John the Baptist, heard of it, heard that he'd been head beheaded, heard of his death, they came and they took his body and they laid it in a tomb. All the signs of hope there. There seems to be nothing. All the laughter is back at the banquet. All of the laughter, all the food, everything that anyone could possibly want. And here you have the moment where the disciples of John the Baptist simply come and they're told they laid him in a tomb. This, I think, tells us something about Christian hope and the depth of Christian hope as well. Because when we read about this moment, we ask ourselves, well, which group of people would I rather be with? Those at the banquet or those who respectfully and beautifully are just taking the body of John the Baptist and laying it in a tomb? And something tells us they're oriented, if you like, towards what's right and what's good. And as we read this passage, we know that they're directed also to what is true. The way that St. Mark tells us of this in his gospel, they came and took his body, they laid it in a tomb. As Christians, we can read this passage without thinking ourselves and being aware ourselves of Jesus himself being laid in the tomb. As we read this with our Christian understanding, Christian faith as we read this, we know we're kind of being invited to connect what's happening here to the death and therefore to the resurrection of Jesus himself. So the hope, if you want, it's not something superficial, not something that kind of dismisses and says that the evil doesn't matter. It's not a kind of false jollity or a false laughter. What would those disciples of John the Baptist have looked like as, as they courageously done this? They weren't filled with that kind of superficial hope or that false kind of empty sort of happiness. They came and they did this. But as we read this scene, we know that this scene is filled with hope. And that, I think, can help all of us. It can help all of us at those moments of struggle in our lives to say, even this moment, I can live with Christian hope. And it's connected to what I was trying to kind of recognize in the Our Father as well. It's not a superficial dismissing of suffering, of evil, of wickedness, of things not being as they should be. That's not what Christian hope is. It's something that reaches far deeper than that. And it's something far more real. And that's the hope that I think during this year, during this year of Jubilee, when we're invited to recognize, yes, this particular year is a pilgrimage of hope. But it reminds us that as disciples of the Lord, we are pilgrims of hope. We're on a journey. We're heading in a direction. And we know that it's a good direction. We know we're pointing in the right direction. Just going to take a moment just now because I think this is a really helpful way of understanding the Our Father, particularly in relation to hope. Something I've just kind of been noticing recently, maybe when I was <clears throat> trying to think about the Our Father and what it does for us and how it fits into our lives as Christians. I was thinking of the place of the Our Father as we pray it in the Mass. And just to take a moment of this, because so often, as we know, when we pray the Our Father, it kind of comes and it goes, and we've not entered into it, we've not entered into the words, we've not kind of 
realised what's happening and it's come and it's gone and, and we move on. And we haven't allowed it, if you like, to kind of form us, to direct us. But here's just a little couple of moments to talk about where it comes in with us. What are the words that we're listening to right about it? What are the words that we hear before it? What do we do that helps us not just to allow it to kind of wash over our heads as we say it? So in the Mass, after the consecration, when the bread and wine have become the body and blood of Christ, we have what's called the doxology, the turning and giving praise to the Father through Jesus. And the priest says, through him, with him, and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours forever and ever. And everyone responds, Amen. That's the moment when we then all stand, getting ready to pray the Our Father. But what have we already done? We're pointing towards God our Father, that goodness, that absolute goodness that we know is real. Already saying those words is an act of hope. So we're directed towards that perfect, all-powerful goodness of God. We then all stand and we get ready to pray the Our Father. But again, there are words which changed when the new translation came in that took sometimes a bit of time to get used to compared to the ones that we used before. But it's a more direct, or more literal translation from the original Latin. But I think this is helpful as well. So he says this, before we even start praying, reminding us of what we're doing, getting us ready to do what we're doing as we pray to our Father, and the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say. All of that, I think, is important. First of all, remember what I said about our faith and our hope being on solid ground. So not just this big idea, hope so, but on solid ground. When we're praying the Our Father, it's one of the moments where, as we say every single word of that prayer, we know we're on the most solid ground possible because we're saying these words at our Saviour's command. Remember the picture at the beginning, Jesus handing to his disciples the words of the Father, which we receive. And there's something so good as we do this, like going, I'm saying what the Lord wants me to say. I'm asking God for what Jesus has told me to ask him for at the Saviour's command. And formed by divine teaching, again, our Christian hope comes to us because we're formed, we're shaped by that divine teaching that comes from Jesus, the way he teaches us, the way he instructs us, the things he reveals to us. All of that shapes us. And if we allow ourselves to be shaped by that, that's where we can carry out our acts of Christian hope. And the final bit, which really some of us find it more difficult to get used to when we first started seeing it in the Mass. We dare to save. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to save. But I've started to really like this because it actually gives us the sense no, when I'm saying these words, I'm actually making an act of courage. I'm doing something courageous. I'm, I'm saying and I'm asking. For these things, which kind of reminds us about hope, but hope we know, like faith and charity, the theological virtues, it's a gift from God, but at the same time as being a gift from God, it's something we can actually set about doing, something we can put into action. As with love, kind of one of the lies of the modern world that tells us love something is either there or it's not, either kind of appears or it disappears. Same with hope, something. I wake up this morning and because of what's happened, because of what, what I'm feeling like, because of my personality, I either feel, feel full of hope or I, or I don't. And then I just have to get on with it. Our Christian virtues are not like that. And that's why I like this sense, we dare to say. And it's kind of saying, yeah, I'm doing something really courageous and, and daring and, and I'm carrying out this act of hope as I'm about to say these words. But... I've got the daring to say it, if you like, because Jesus has commanded me to do it. 
I have no doubt in my mind that I see the words of the young father that I'm doing something right and good, that I'm asking for things, not only that are right and good to ask for, but I know that they can be answered by God because Jesus commanded me to say these words. He knows that God can do all of these things that we list in the Our Father. He's formed me by his teaching, and so I dare to say, so just a reminder, at the Mass, when we're there, kind of think about that. We've got the doxology, kind of giving glory, giving glory to God. And then we stand up, and often people just kind of push themselves up and like, right, people it's like, no, I'm about to do this act of daring, as I say to our Father. It's like, for me, that's, that's what hope is. It's not this vague thing, it's this daring thing, but I know it's right to do this daring thing, because I've been commanded by Jesus to do it. I'm formed and I'm shaped by his teaching. That's just a reminder and something we can have in our heads as we're thinking of that. At the Savior's command, remember Jesus actually giving the Our Father to his disciples and say, say this. Same in Luke's Gospel, teach us how to pray. When you pray, say this. So when we're doing it, what a kind of good way of praying. We often think, I don't know how to pray, I don't know what to say, I don't, it's like, well, whatever. We know we're right and we know we're start doing something good when we're doing this. Let's move on a little bit because here as well, this kind of helps us, the setting of the Our Father in the Mass. Going back, it's after the consecration. Our Lord is truly there, living and present with us. The bread and wine have become the body and blood of Christ. We've then made that dot doxology. We're oriented towards, we're directed towards the Father. We're giving him glory. We stand, we're reminded that we've been commanded to do this by the Lord. We're reminded that we've been formed and shaped by his teaching. Therefore, we're standing on solid ground as we make this hope-filled prayer. We're daring to see this. But almost immediately afterwards, the words that we say together are these words, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. So in the context of the Our Father, that hope-filled prayer, a prayer that acknowledges our need for salvation, but points in hope, meaning something totally justified, standing on solid ground as we do it, we then say, yes, the Lamb of God. And it's something that it just fits so perfectly. He was hope as well. What does it acknowledge? It acknowledges the sins of the world. It acknowledges our need for the mercy of the Lord. It acknowledges the lack of peace in the world. But we're turning towards the one place where all of that can be and is found. Returning towards the Lord as we celebrate Mass, the mystery, the saving <coughs> mystery of his death and resurrection. And on solid ground, because we know he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that's the context that we find the Our Father in. It all fits kind of beautifully together. Often at Mass, we just want to get one bit and the next bit and the next bit. But if we kind of get a sense of how this is moving and how it's all shaping us in the same direction, how it's all making us people of hope, how it's all making us pilgrims of hope. Something that I heard recently, which I haven't heard before this year, on the feast day of, I always get this wrong, Pope St. John Paul, what order did you say the words? <laughs> John Paul II, who is, who is now a saint, that he said, this about the Eucharist. And when you first think here, you think, really? How can that make sense? But he says this, in that little post is the solution to all the problems of the world. But having looked at the Mass, the words of the Mass, what's happening, who this is, when we said, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. We recognise and we acknowledge but John Paul II was right. In that small post, in that little post, solution to all the problems of the world. 
and again to me what a wonderful encapsulation of what Christian hope is standing on solid ground because we know that this is true we know that Jesus is the saviour and the redeemer of the world we know that we live in a broken world John Paul II knew that he lived in a broken world he's talking about all the problems of the world Pointing in this direction, he's pointing towards that absolute goodness, directed towards that. He's directed towards what God alone can do, what we can't bring about for ourselves. That's what hope is. And yet we have this part to play. We have this act of daring. And to see that, that's a daring thing for John Paul II to have said, just as it's a daring thing. To pray the Our Father. It's an act of courage, but it's something that's reliable and good and true. And there's another picture of John Paul II that kind of reminded me, looking at that, of the picture, the Rembrandt picture. Let me just go back to it because there's only one more. If I can flip through this, the one give you that picture. Simeon holding Jesus in his arms. That light build. Now my eyes have seen the salvation that we've prepared for all the nations. But it's a looking forward because we are not there yet. And kind of that's the same. When John, John Paul II when he was holding the host, and here is the solution to all the problems of the world. It's just like Simeon holding Jesus and saying, now my eyes have seen the salvation that we've prepared for all the peoples of light to enlighten the nations of the Gentiles, the glory of the people, Israel, the solution to all the problems in the world. If you're not a person of faith, if you're not a Christian, you would maybe laugh at that idea and kind of try and get on and carry on with the kind of little hopes that come one day and go the next. But as a Christian, we know that it's true. We know that we're on solid ground when we're seeing this. We know that we're on solid ground every time we're there at Mass and the position of the Our Father in the midst of that, even in the middle of it, give us this day our daily bread. When we say that at Mass, it has a different resonance from the resonance it has when we say it in our daily lives, where we know that we're asking for the necessities that we need. But at that moment, in the rite of communion at Mass, where we say, give us this day our daily bread, we know that we're asking for something more than that. We're asking that host that John Paul II tells us, in that host is the solution to all the problems of the world. All of this is Christian prayer. It's what Christian prayer is, but maybe just a suggestion to, to, to leave you with, just to think about that. Hope is something that I can exercise, that I can put into practice, that I can go about doing, that I can make that daring act of hoping that's something that I can do and can set about doing, starting, starting now. And of course, we, we, we do that already, but just to think, that's Christian hope. And when we turn on the television and we see things that kind of dishearten us, that make us dispirited or dejected or despondent, or all those words beginning with D, all the bad that we have, it's like, then we remind ourselves that I have Christian hope. Yes, I'm standing in the midst of all of this, but I'm standing on solid ground, the solid ground of the teaching that's come to me, the solid ground of the Lord himself who's been given to me, just as he was given to Simeon, just as he, as he was given to John Paul II. I'm standing on this solid ground, and I'm looking towards not some vague thing that I don't know where it is or exactly what it is. I'm looking towards what I know is absolutely and reliably and trustworthy, real and true. Not just things being made a little bit better, but things being absolutely and perfectly as they should be. And all of that, and this is the kind of lie again that gets kind of thrown in the face of Christians so often. If you're looking towards something like that, then you're not going to bother about all of the things that you need to do in your daily lives. Absolutely is the opposite is, is the case. If we don't have that real and ultimate hope, what we're going to do in the end is despair because we see one thing not working out after another, after another. We say to ourselves, 
what does it all matter? I might as well give up. But that hope, that ultimate hope that we're given, tells us also that not a single act of goodness, nothing that's good or true or beautiful in the world or in our lives will ever be lost. In the prayer of the Jubilee, it talks about a new heaven and a new earth. Everything that we do that's good and right and beautiful and true, no act will ever be lost. However destroyed or dysfunctional all the small hopes in the world that we live in seem to be, if we're oriented towards the goodness of God, if we're standing on that solid ground that he gives us, we know that every act that's in accordance with God's will, only will be done that we carry on out. Every act of that sort has an infinite and infinitely precious value. So, year of hope, pilgrimage of hope, becoming pilgrims of hope, let's really think about that. I'm really trying to get a sense how is my Christian hope different? And even when I use the word hope in another way in my everyday language, and it's fine to do that, to think, thank goodness that my Christian hope has a firmer foundation than those little hopes that I have and that it's not wrong to have. But we stop and think, but how good it is that my Christian hope is so much more solid and reliable and good and true.